Well, good evening. All right, sounds like everything's good there. Hi, how's everybody? Uh, Tuesday evening, welcome aboard. Uh, we'll uh, hang out here for just a minute while we get a few more people connected. Uh, got some interesting information to share with uh, with everybody tonight. Um, last week, Sam Allen asked about uh, you know his batteries. He was going to get some SOK lithiums for his rig, and uh, that got me off on a uh, thanks, Aaron, uh, on a tangent this past week. And so I did quite a bit of research, and I'm going to share some information with you about lithium batteries that I discovered. I think you'll find it interesting. So. Uh, then uh, we'll follow up. I got distracted last week, so I have a little bit of housekeeping to do. Uh, we were talking about the different colored uh, propane hoses, uh, black, red, and green. And uh, so I looked into that a little bit, uh, and I got distracted last week when we were talking about it. So I just wanted to say that I didn't talk about the application for each. And as we discovered, or we know that, uh, the hoses are rated for different amount numbers of BTUs. And so, for example, let's say you have a 200,000 BTU propane space heater that you're putting in your garage or some kind of a space like that. Well, then you would want that high capacity hose versus, uh, you know, like an RV. Um, I don't, you know, gosh, doing the math, if, even if you had everything running, you know, I wouldn't think you would be using more than about 50,000 BTUs. So um, I think that a black hose would be appropriate in that case. And then the green hose kind of fell there in the middle. And I kind of imagine the green hose as being something like, um, uh, like a weed burner or something like that where you might be uh, needing a few more BTUs than you get off the black hose. I'd be a good sized weed burner, but I could see it happening. So, anyway, I wanted to clear that up. Let's go over to the chat real quick. And if you're just joining, uh, welcome. If you have a moment, I uh, appreciate those thumbs up. Uh, those really help get the video ranked up and get more people to see it. And that's always a good thing. Uh, Tim Myers is in tonight. Good to see you, Tim. John's in from uh, Florida. Uh, Tim's in Ohio. And. Uh, Tim and I were chatting. He got a check engine code today on his rig. <laughs> uh, 158 miles an hour, huh, Tim? Anyway, that's pretty funny. Um, in the pre, in the pre-function, if you will, in the pre-chat, we were having a discussion. And uh, uh, Gray Graybird. Oh, by the way, Gray Graybird is in, and I just want to mention that he started a YouTube channel, and uh, I. Um, watched his first video uh, it's well his first talking video there was another one out there but um, uh, let's see here I seem to have lost something here there it is okay so that's Grace channel I just shared the link to it uh, run out and check it out and subscribe for me uh, let him know that I sent you over and I know he's in the chat tonight so hey Gray it's a good story, and uh, we'll see if we can get you a few more subscribers, get you a few more people to watch your stories. It was good. He was talking about how his wife, when she takes the her Subaru Outback, and they argue with her about there being a dick, dipstick. Uh, those manual transmissions always had the dipstick back there. I had an old Subaru Brat from many, many years ago, and it had the dipstick for the transmission. Our buddy Aaron's in. Oh, by the way, and Aaron's gonna. Are you gonna do the Saturday night thing permanently, Aaron? Um, I was I was teaching a class on tying flies this weekend, well Saturday, and so uh, I was just getting out of the class and I grabbed my phone to check, um, you know what was going on, and I saw that he had a stream up and I went out and caught it and. They were just chatting about stuff, and it was kind of interesting. So are you going to be doing that uh, on Saturdays, uh, Aaron, pretty regularly? Because um, it was kind of fun. Um, I'll try to make it this Saturday. 
I have got to make one adjustment here, just a minute. Let's see if I can keep from crashing the stream. I got a cable in the way here, and I can't read the comments. Oops, and I just moved the camera too. All right, I just made a mess. That's why you don't mess with stuff in the middle of a stream. All right, that's okay. So, uh, anyway. Walter Pate's in from South Georgia. Good to see you, Walter. Lola's in. She's in uh, Colorado Springs, I think. Lola, isn't that? That's where you're at. Uh, did you get my note on uh, your uh, lens? The uh, Lola had a question. She emailed me a picture. Um, oh, gosh, it's been a couple weeks ago now about how to get a lens off of a light that she has. And since I know that Lola's in here, I'll just flip over here real quick and we'll share this with you. I'm going to pull this out of the way. So Lola's, that's your light. And if you see there, just squeeze it where those two uh, arrows are. And you might have to squeeze it pretty hard. It's pretty stiff plastic. Uh, worst case scenario, if you look right up in here, um, let me get over here where I can, uh, oh, that's not what I wanted, sorry. I, I hate this. But if you look right here where that little tab is, you could very gently put a uh, like a, a dull table knife up in there and pry it gently uh, and you should be able to pry that light out of there but if you just squeeze that lens that I'm showing you there you should be uh, in really good shape um, it could be really stiff and hard to get squeezed so Pac-Man Bob's in from California. Good to see you, Pac-Man. And uh, Sam Allen. Okay, great, Sam. Great. I'm glad you're here because i got some good information for you. We're going to have a nice chat, and we'll get to that in just a bit. Uh, okay, Aaron is at 7 Central. Um, okay, so... Uh, okay, so we got a couple questions that came in. Uh, so Sam stick with me. Uh, I want to go back and Eric Myers had a question uh, on a Conan 7500 generator randomly shows the running light on the control panel and it sounds like a relay is chattering near the start switch. Push any rocker switch to the start position and it quits. Eric do you have an automatic generator start system when your batteries get low? Uh, some some uh, rigs will have uh, an automatic starting system. Uh, if your batteries get below a certain point, it's a set point you can set. Uh, and then uh, basically your inverter sends a signal to usually a relay that then says, okay, I need to start the generator and charge the batteries. So do you have that kind of a, a system in place in automatic generator start? Uh, and if you don't, then we'll chat. Um, I saw another question come in from Bob Cross from upstate New York. Hi Bob, so nice to have you here. How would I rate the need for RV water softener? Some of our camping sites have very hard water. Is it worth it? Um, yes. I went a very long time, and I'm in the West, and the West has notoriously hard water. Um, but um, I went for a very long time without a water softener. And I finally ponied up, I think the one I bought, well, a cheap plug over on my Amazon store. There's a link in the description of this video. I think it's on my page, Handy Items for RV Owners. But you'll see the water softener I bought in there. I believe it was around 200 um, But it was very much worth it. I was in Tucson uh, wintering. Um, this would have been three years ago now when I first got it. And it was really nice to not have that super hard water. Uh, the soap scum problem on the shower door and, and the you know the you know stuff lathered. I mean, I had to cut down on the amount of shampoo I was using. You know that kind of stuff. But yeah, it was worth it. It's not a big hassle. Um, it recharges with table salt. 
uh, I had you know I would recharge mine about every two months something like that when you know running through the winter and of course in an RV you get really adept at not using a lot of water and so I don't know that I used a lot of water I think I was probably getting maybe 1500 gallons out of that water softener I had uh, so I think it's worth it especially if you're in an area with hard water uh, it definitely would it makes your water much more pleasant and it's a lot you know not quite as hard on your appliances your faucets and that kind of stuff so yeah I guess probably the only drawback is is you know they're probably 16 18 20 inches high depending upon how you think you buy one I have to slide back here so you can see that um, and uh, you know they're roughly the size of a you know well think of a uh, scuba diving tank that's about the size of them and uh, so if you got the storage space, then you probably are in good shape. Uh, okay, so hi, Linda. Camp Gore one's in tonight. Great to see you, Linda. Uh, yeah, okay, so Aaron is going to do doing a live stream, 7 p.m. Central Time, over on his channel, Three Tails RV. And, uh, yeah, go over there and check that out. Uh, I think I'll try to be there Saturday night. Eric says he does not know. Have a timer to start. Okay, so, yeah, something in that, you say you have a timer to start it. In other words, you have something that you can set uh, to start it at a particular time, or is it something that you can set so it only runs a certain amount of time? Uh... Okay, Lola, yeah, thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, that should get you going. Hi, Tom. Good to see you tonight. Tom Downey's in. Okay, Bob, sorry, i got to move this wire again. For whatever reason, this wire is just in the time tonight. Okay, yeah, sure, Bob. Uh, he says, uh, great uh, great for the time. Well, I will look at your Amazon link. Great. Uh, we have the space. Thanks again for my advice. You're very welcome, Bob. Yeah, um, and if it's not on there, just search for RV water softener. And I got the, uh, I'm almost positive it's going to be on that page um, uh, of uh, handy items for RV owners. I, that's kind of my master list of stuff that I found handy uh, as I lived and traveled around in an RV. Okay, so I wanted to chat about... Uh, um, Sam Allen asked uh, about his SOK batteries and we got to chatting about charging from the alternator through the bird system. He has a Dutch Star uh, similar to, well, his is a couple years older, but Tom Downey also has a Dutch Star. But in the Dutch Stars and in a lot of RVs, uh, they have a charge control system, sometimes called a battery isolator. And what that does is that it takes excess power from the alternator and it will charge your house batteries with it. So what that means is that as you're driving down the road, you're actually charging your house batteries, the batteries that you use for your lights and your uh, microwave and TVs and all that stuff, okay? The, stuff, the power that gets inverted, uh, or even if it's not inverted. But So it's, it's pretty common. And the way they work is, is they just monitor the battery voltages and if the chassis battery voltage is below 13.8 volts, which is sort of the normal running number for a, a chassis rolling down the road with an alternator running, uh, if, it's, if it's sitting at 13.8 volts, then the bird system will check, take and it will switch a relay and it sends power to the house batteries and charges your house batteries. The question came up is, does it make sense or is it safe to do that? And in the and as I dug into this question, the first thing I did was I went out and I looked at the spec sheets. And so what I'm going to do is, let me pop this over here. And next week, I'm going to have, uh, I finally bought a switcher. Um, I was kind of doing some research trying to decide which one was going to work for me. And so I, I ended up with the Elgato. So I won't have to do all this uh, monkeying around here. 
but I want to go over here and let's look at this is the SOK battery spec sheet and it's pretty typical um, of your lithium iron phosphate battery specs okay um, nominal voltage 12.8 volts this is a hundred amp hour capacity battery um, so on and so forth okay this is not a bad spec sheet but the thing that came up is the recommended charge current of 20 amps and a maximum charge current of 50 amps and here's my concern let me flip over here real quick here's my concern you're gonna have two of those batteries and what got me down this rat hole was as I started to try to understand what those batteries really look like when you're charging. Because think about how your batteries are connected. They've got cables going to them, and then there's cables between the batteries if you have multiple batteries. Say you have four six volt batteries. That's going to be a serial parallel type of setup. And so, but for all intents and purposes, it makes it look like one large battery. So what that means is, is that if you have two 100 amp hour batteries, you have 200 amp hours of capacity, and your recommended maximum charge current will be 40 amps. Okay, so it doubles. The recommended charge current is the current that you can charge the battery with and cause the least amount of degradation because of charging. Every time you charge and discharge a battery, I don't care what kind it is, you lose a little bit of capacity. I actually wrote an article on this. Let's run over here and take a quick look at my website, trbolin.com. I just posted this article yesterday, and this article grew out of me doing the research for Sam on his batteries. Before I forget Sam, we need to get something in there to not overcharge your batteries. I'm worried about your uh, alternator overcharging. More on that in just a second. So anyway, I wrote this real quick article, but what I came over here for was just to kind of show you the number of cycles and versus the depth of discharge. Now, what the depth of just discharge is, is how deep you discharge that battery, how much capacity in that battery you use, before you start to charge it again. If you use 80%, this green line predicts about what your battery number of cycles will be versus if you discharge it to 100% every time or you know most times when you use the batteries you completely run them down before you recharge them. You can see here that the lifespan of that battery is shortened if you look right here. Okay, And then if you go to 50% of discharge, depth of discharge of 50%, it really extends the life of the battery. So I'm telling you all this because I want you to make a decision on your own. I'll make a recommendation, but you make your own decision. And that is... The maximum charge current on that battery is 50 amps. So that means you can send 50 amps of power to that battery. Actually, because we've got two of them, you can send as much as 100 amps. Keeping in mind that if you send the maximum charge current, it degrades the battery a little bit faster than if you send the recommended charge current. So if you consistently send the maximum amount of charge current to that battery, you're going to shorten the lifespan a little bit because the harder and the faster you charge it, the more it degrades the battery. If you charge it at the recommended rate, that's going to give you the best performance, the best recharge versus how damaging recharging about the battery is. I hope that makes sense. Okay. You can probably get by with no, with nothing but your bird if you use the two batteries and you assume a 100 amp charge. 
if you want to max maximize the life of that span of that battery, you may want to look into getting a DC to DC charge controller. And what those do is, is they take the DC charge coming in and they limit how much goes to the battery. It's just a way to protect the battery and maintain the battery uh, in a good condition and for a longer period of time. So you might want to look at that if you really want to extend the life of your batteries. However, you might also want to consider looking at a different battery, maybe a little more expensive, that has a higher recommended charge current. Let me flip back over to the screen here, to the monitor here. And let's go over here and look at one of my favorites, Battleborn. And Battleborn, you can send its recommended charge current is 100 amps. Okay? Uh, excuse me, is 50 amps. Excuse me, 50 amps is the recommended charge current on the Battleborns. Okay? And if you have a group of four of those, it could be as much as 200 amps. So in my particular case, in my RV, I have four 100 amp hour batteries. Assuming that I can charge each at 50 amp hours, then I can send as much as 200 amps of current to my battery pack, <clears throat> my lithium battery pack, and not damaging, not damaging it too much. My solar charge controller is only 100 amps. And keep in mind, I've only ever seen 100 amps on like June 23rd, you know, the summer solstice when the sun was directly overhead. Uh, you know, you, you rarely will get the maximum off your solar charge controller. Uh, you know, my average is probably around 50 amps, 60 amps. And so when I was on solar and charging my lithium batteries, I was charging them at a pretty low rate. Even if I'm on my inverter charger, which is a 150 amp charger, I'm still not going to be exceeding the capacity to charge those batteries. I'm still going to be below the, the, you know, the maximum charge current. And so I think that really helps. The specifications that I've, I've noticed, the specifications are different. I mean, the SKVs, I really liked the way they looked, okay? They're in, they're, they were good. Their batteries seemed like they'd be really solid. The Battleborns, I have personal experience with the Battleborns, so I tend to like those. You know, like I say, SKV has a pretty, pretty well laid out, pretty easily read spec sheet. Battleborn does too. I just happened to grab the wrong page here. But they have a spec sheet similar to that. But if you want to look at the Cadillac of battery spec sheets, <laughs> you got to look at Rely On. This is their 100 amp hour uh, battery. And this thing, this is a serious battery right here. Okay. Uh, 100 amp hours. But the thing about this particular battery is it ha it's self-heating. Now, Battleborn offers a self-heating battery as well. Self-heating only matters if you're, you know, uh, camping in, in freezing conditions because if you charge a lithium battery in freezing weather, you'll plate out um, lithium on the, on, the an on the anode. Yeah, I think you plate lithium onto the anode, which destroys the anode. So that's why you do not want to charge a lithium battery at below, zero, or at below freezing temperatures. But yeah, this this battery company tells you everything you could potentially want to know about their batteries. And you know, I really, you know, I really like. Uh, I mean, you know, as far as understanding the data goes, uh, this company was really good. Um, and so I guess it really comes down to, I'm going to flip back over here. I guess it really comes down to, you've got to try to find a balance between how you think you're going to use that battery. For example, if you're not camping in freezing conditions, then you can probably not worry about 
whether you're going to have to charge the battery at freezing uh, when it's freezing. So maybe that's not something that's important to you. You don't need a heated battery. Um, stuff like that. So I, if you want to stick, Sam, if you want to stick with charging at a recommended rate off of the alternator through your bird, you could go up to 40 amps, which I think is going to be borderline for your alternator. Now, I don't know exactly how big your alternator is, but it's going to be 90 amps or bigger. And when you're riding down the road and running, you probably only require you probably only need 15 to 20 amps, so you're probably going to have 70 amps more or less available. Uh, you know, so 70 amps falls within the range of maximum charge current. Um, you could make a decision that way. Uh, overall, you're probably going to be okay with the SOKs, uh, but you might want to think about some kind of a DC to DC charge controller. I know that uh, Tom Downey is has a DC to DC charge controller uh, on his pack. Um, we had we've chatted about that in the past as well. Hope that helps. Okay, Camp Gore One asks. If I use my propane when I turn the valve on, do I need to turn it on all the way or just a little? Turn it on all the way. That's standard practice. Oh, mountain air, yeah. But I would. Th oh, yeah, that's right. You're that oddball, but you still have uh, the bird system on the mountain air. Okay, so Eric Meyer says, he just looked, we were chatting about Eric's uh, generator chattering, and it sounds to me like um, the auto start's probably trying to do something, and you're probably going to have to dig into it and figure it out, Eric. Um, yeah, it sounds like maybe the auto start is sensing the batteries are low and wanting to start uh, your generator. Um, and that would, that's what the chatter could be. The, and it could also be chattering because uh, maybe your chassis batteries are low and there's not enough there to get the starter to engage on the uh, generator. Um, but yeah, it sounds like you have an auto start that is going wonky and you're going to have to dig into that. Yeah, Victron has some great videos. That's right, Tom. Uh, there's some great videos on by Victron, uh, and then uh, and they can recommend. Uh, you know, they'll recommend to you. They're really good, uh, really good guys. Um, they'll recommend to you what would be best for your batteries. But I can tell you right now, 40 amps. If you want to maintain those batteries as long as possible, 40 amps is the maximum you'd want to send to them. I suspect that your uh, inverter, if you have a 2,000 watt inverter, you probably have a 100 amp charger. And so you're probably going to want to, well, you're definitely going to want to set up your in, uh, inverter uh, with the charge parameters for those batteries. And uh, that's easy to do. Uh, the magnums, uh, the, the magnums that are in there. Uh, are more than capable of uh, charging a lithium battery pack. Uh, they have manual settings that you go to. And let me just run over here real quick. And right here, you know, your charge performance, the charge voltage you're going to want to set at 14.6. And uh, uh, let's see, float. There should be an a indication somewhere on this spec sheet that tells us what the float is, but that's probably 13.8. Um, but you should be able to find it, the specs, the charging specifications for this battery, and then uh, go into uh, uh, go into your inverter and set it up with the specifications. And I believe you can even limit the amount of charge that the inverter will send it. 
you know, keep in mind that if you're sitting on pedestal power and you're there for days on end or you're there for a couple of days, then you don't need to charge full boat, okay? Set the inverter to charge at 40 amp hours or 40 or 40 amps basically. Um, and just let it take as long as it takes to charge those batteries up. You're going to be a lot better off in the long run uh, slow charging those batteries than fast charging them. They're going to last a lot longer. Okay. Um, yeah, cost versus performance. The the hard part of that, Aaron, uh, to the hard part of that to sort out, I should say, is that a lot of the manufacturers don't give you the great specs like, uh, oh, that rely on. I mean, they they showed it to you. You know, they showed you the cost versus performance. Well, you could get to that. Um, no problem um, on their spec sheet. They had it all graphed out. Uh, okay, um, Kim Myers, 100 amp solar charge only when the moon is in the seventh house and Jupiter aligns with Mars. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I saw 100 amps. I did. I saw 1,424. Uh, watts coming off my roof uh, I could probably find a picture of it and I'll do that and I'll show it to you guys next week uh, but yeah I pulled this I pulled this uh, 1424 watts off my roof remember I have an 1860 watt array uh, so I was getting the full hundred amps but that was on June you know 20th 21st something like that and it was solar noon so the Sun was directly over my solar panels they were wide open, they were not shaded in any way, shape, or form, and they were harvesting kilowatts. I'll tell you what, it was really fun. But I got a picture of it, uh, of the the Victron equipment has a very nice Bluetooth interface, which really makes it worth it. So you can monitor. Uh, Tom says he has a 30 amp DC to DC charger. It will recharge the four batteries within two hours at road speeds. There you go. Uh, true, yeah. Be careful some batteries won't fit in the box. Um, if you stick with the... Uh, you want to check your d dimensions, that's for sure. But um, I believe that... I believe... I won't flip screens here. I'll just look real quick at the dimensions. Yeah, ten by seven by eight, so those are gonna they should fit okay for you. Uh, but if you're replacing six volts, uh, you're not gonna get all four batteries in the same space you had the four six volt batteries. Um, that the tray is not big enough. Uh, that's on, you know, the the new Mars uh, specific to uh, Sam and uh, myself and Tim, or um, uh, myself and uh, Tom. Oh, so you got a, Linda uh, Kempgore one says she got herself a small Jackery. Excellent. Those are really highly rated. I see a lot of, uh, you know, people nomading around with those. Um Oh, and I missed a comment. Yeah, Tom, that's a good point. Uh, Eric, the place to start is you can clean all the contacts you can get to. Uh, and then I, I, I see you say you're on shore power. Um, your batteries still might be low. Your chassis batteries, I mean, your house batteries still might be low. Um, you know, uh, especially if you've been sitting on shore power for a long time. Do you exercise your batteries occasionally? In other words, do you kill your shore power and let your inverter work for a few minutes? Question mark. Uh, Sam Allen says, Northeast Oregon, okay. Uh, well, I'm in Southeast Idaho, so you're not that far away, Sam. 
Uh, winters get below zero, yep. Uh, they're not camping. RV sits plugged in to a 50 amp service all winter long. Perfect. Uh, you winterize it, of course, or do you keep it heated? Sam Allen. Everything I found indicates that the alternator on that 2000 Freightliner Cat chassis is 160 amps. Okay, that, that makes sense. Uh, and so it is very capable of overcharging those batteries without a DC to DC charge controller in the middle. Um, so you don't want to get into that situation. I could not confirm or deny uh, from the specs that if you sent more than 50 amps to the battery, it would just shut down. It wouldn't charge. Um, the companies and their battery monitoring systems, that's pretty proprietary information. I don't like to share that. So, uh, yeah, it's hard to say, but uh, yeah, 160 amp alternator would definitely overcharge those. Anytime, Sam. So, uh, sorry, this cotton picking thing, hang on here. Let me see if I can move this down, this will help. Uh, Camp Blair once says she bought a new donated 12 volt heating blanket at a thrift store. Use a little Jackery with it. Love it. <laughs> Get my butt warm at uh, Box Van D's meetup a couple weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, um, I had an electric blanket. Um, but my electric blanket was on my Magnum inverter. Did not like to run because that was a modified sine wave. And when I changed to the Xantrex, which was a pure sine wave, remember modified sine waves are square and the pure sine waves look like real, uh, you know, like real sine waves. Um, it would run on that, but it did not like to run on the modified sine wave inverter. Hi, GrooveJet. So nice to see you. Yeah, Tom says clean every contact in the system. Yeah. Uh, spend a few dollars on this, Eric. Get yourself some of this. Can you read that? This is deoxid D5, and this is specifically made to clean electrical contacts. I swear by it. I always keep a can on hand. Um, the radio you see sitting over my shoulder there. Uh, I just used it on that here a couple weeks ago. Um, I was trying to change bands and it was getting really noisy. And I popped the cover off and got down in there and put a little in the switches and worked them back and forth and they're back to brand new, like like everything. Yeah, okay, so Lola asked a question. Please talk about exercising RV batteries while plugged into power. Okay. So it's just good practice that every once in a while, especially in lead acid batteries, not so much on lithiums, but if you have lead acids especially, is to just drop your shore power and just run on your batteries for half hour, 45 minutes. And uh, what that does is it helps prevent sulfation. And what sulfation is, is that if a battery sits and it's sitting there floating for a very long time, sulfur will start to plate onto the anode or cathode, let me think, be on the anode because it's sulfur's positive, the anode's negative. And that could shorten the life of the battery. But if you use that battery every once in a while, you know, and it, you know, once a month is all it really takes, just drop your shore power and run on your, ba on your battery power uh, for 15, 20, 30 minutes, something like that. Then go back and flip your shore power back on. That'll give your uh, inverter charger a chance to charge your batteries back up, bring them through a nice fresh cycle. It'll help blast a little bit of that sulfur off the plates. And it'll help keep those batteries in a lot better shape. Uh, so yeah, it's just, it's just a practice of running those batteries every once in a while, say for 30 minutes. Uh, but yeah, it helps prevent the sulfation um, and the degradation of the battery sitting there at a float charge uh, for a very long time.
Okay, Eric says no. All right, well, yeah, I think then um, clean those contacts. I think Tom has a good uh, point. You're going to have to dig into and figure out your uh, automatic start. I, I would try to help you, you know, if that's if that's something you need some help with. Uh, send me the, uh, uh, if you can find the model number, I need the actual model number of the generator. Uh, and probably uh, what inverter you have. And if you happen to know where the automatic start is, would be very helpful. Uh, I might be able to look at some information and maybe give you some ideas on how to troubleshoot that. Uh, but I think a good place to look, absolute place to start is check your chassis batteries, make their sure, make sure they're at voltage, uh, and then go through and do like Tom said and, and clean up all the contacts with some contact cleaner. Uh, and if that doesn't do it, then yeah. I mean, you could have a flaky relay. Uh, you might just have a relay, you know, that is just wearing out and it's easy enough to, you know, replace those relays. Um, you know, uh, but yeah, I, I could help Eric if I had part numbers or model numbers of the equipment. I could go look up the operating manuals and, and get you down the road a little further. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do it, you know, other than just kind of give you some high, high ideas like I just did. Lola says she's plugged in 24-7 in in Colorado. Got to minus 15 for a couple days and around zero for more days. Yeah, um, I was in Golden in 2013 at uh, Thanksgiving when it got to 22 below. And I was burning propane like no tomorrow. Cubby Butler in. Hi. Good to see you tonight, Cubby. Hope you're well. Where did you park it? He says he just parked a semi. You're welcome, Eric. Uh, Aaron, uh, okay, so yeah, Tom Downey. Uh, my, my get set, my gen set, I think is probably what you meant. It's probably uh, voice recognition. My gen set would not start. The cable on the gen set cabinet was loose. Guess how many days to find it. Uh, seven. Yeah, and that's a good point. Uh, Tom says uh, you could try to bypass the uh, auto start uh, with a good battery hooked up directly to the uh, generator. Yeah, see if those will turn on, uh, Eric, if you could pop off. Um, and watch them because you know they might go down fast and if they do that means you might mean you need to replace your chassis battery or your house batteries excuse me uh, Linda says Camp Gore says she's going to get a solar panel for the Jackery it, if it charges to 100% and I don't get it unplugged for a bit will that hurt the battery? No no we're talking about rate of charge or how fast you're charging but once the battery is fully charged, it it can't take any more charge. It just naturally shuts itself off. Um, so yeah, uh, the battery management system will do that for sure. When the battery gets fully charged, it will stop it from uh, charging. Um, that's a safety thing. So the batteries, you know, don't overcharge and catch on fire. Now, overcharging in lead-acid batteries is far more common, um, but we won't we won't dig into that too deep tonight. I'd be happy to talk about lead-acid batteries uh, in more in more detail if you'd like it some other on, this, on another evening. But no, Linda, that will not hurt the battery if it sits there on the solar charger after it's full. It'll just Actually, it's just going to sit there and float. And all floating means is that the battery's full, and now you're just maintaining the battery at a full state, uh, around 13.8 volts, something in that range. Nor Cup Cubby, northern Kentucky to Merrill, Wisconsin, 720 miles. That's a good day. That's a long day. 
I did um, in my RV in 2013 I drove from about 60 miles west of Oklahoma City to um, Kingman, Arizona in a day. I think it was 840 miles. Very poorly planned trip. Thought I'd stop up around Flagstaff and got there and everything was full. So I just had to drive on into Kingman. Yeah, Tom Downey says he has the engine block heater, and uh, it's a wonderful thing when the temps are cold and the electric power is on. Yeah, um, I have the block heater on mine as well, um, and I've actually had to use it a couple times. Um, when I went to move the RV into storage after I bought my apartment there in Denver, uh, I had to run the engine heater for quite a while uh, because I believe it was probably about 12 or 15 degrees that day and yeah I ran it quite a while <laughs> Graybird has says yeah that's a hammer down kind of day it sure is 720 miles that's uh, well if you're if you're driving a semi don't you only get to drive for 11 and a half hours what is that what's 11 into 720 that's about 65 that's uh, that's that's peeing in a bottle when you drive down the road. <laughs> that's no stops. Oh, Eric says he's going with lithium in a couple days. Uh, gotcha. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, camp goer Linda. Uh, she wants to get a larger Jackery. Uh, she has a small AC unit wants to put in the rig. I think it's 5,000 watt AC. Can a Jackery make that run? No. And I don't think it's 5,000 watts. Uh, if it's a window type air conditioner, probably 1,500 watts max, maybe 2,000. That's going to be right on the edge of what the largest Jackery is going to be able to give you. And it's not going to be able to run for very long. If you got an hour at 1,500 watts off of the large Jackery, I would be surprised. Eleven hour, eleven dry hours driving. Three three minutes left on my clock. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Cubby Butler says he had 11 hours driving. Professional drivers, if you didn't know this, have a limited number of hours they can work in any given day. I think they have to take mandatory, is it mandatory 10 minutes every so many hours? I don't, rem I don't know the rules uh, for CD, for commercial drivers, but I know they can only drive so many hours. And they have to take mandatory breaks. <laughs> I I know how what you're saying, Graybird. That's a good one. So so, some trucks were so fast they'd pass me three times in the same day. I I feel that way sometimes. You know, you'd be especially on a, like a long road trip. I I don't. I remember out here on the Oklahoma Turnpike one time driving back from. Uh, uh, Arkansas to Arizona uh, for winter and I used to drive almost the entire length of the uh, Oklahoma Turnpike and you'd get out there and then you would stop and you'd come back out and you'd pass that same truck again and then you know your 100 mile bladder you'd have to stop again and then eventually you'd end up passing that same truck Oh, Sam says he'll have to attend these more often. Makes running server updates for a highly virtualized infrastructure far more pleasant. Well, I don't know if you know my history, Sam, but I was an IT director and then an IT project manager for a large engineering company, and I know a, way more than I want to know about highly virtualized environments. 
VMware, Azure. I moved to data centers for a living the last five years of my IT career. Uh, you know, going to map out data centers and pick them up and move them. Okay, so Linda Kempler once says, should I use my 2000 2500 Predator generator? Will that work? Yeah, it should. Um, you're going to want to check the label rating, or you're going to want to check the rating on that uh, window air conditioner. Um, you know, I'm assuming that's what it is, like a window air conditioner. And, you know, depending upon how many BTUs it is, but you should be able to look up the specs online and see how many, uh, you know, uh, watts it pulls. And you want to match that to your generator. So if it pulls 1,500 watts, your generator makes 2,000. That's enough headroom. You should be good to go. Where you might get in trouble is when it first starts. Uh, with electric motors, uh, there's something called inrush current. And what that is is there, although the motor might only draw 10 amps when it's running, to get it started running, it might take 20 or 25 amps. And although it's only for a couple milliseconds but it takes all that extra energy to you know break gravity basically you know the motor sitting there static and to get the mass moving it takes that extra energy to, to spin it up and get it started once it gets started it, it spins right down in fact if you watched my uh, Atwood uh, heater rebuild video that I did here what a couple weeks ago now uh, I actually show you where I'm starting an electric motor and I show the surge current on that motor. Uh, it starts out at like an amp and a half, then it surges up to 6 amps, and then it falls back off to 3.4 amps. Well, your air conditioner is going to do the same thing. The problem is, is that if it surges up m to more than what the generator can deliver, it will trip. It will trip the generator, and then it won't start the air conditioner. So you may run into a problem with that. You might have heard people talking about soft starts. And what a soft start is, is an extra set of capacitors that you can put in a system with electric motors that make it better and easier for it to start on, you know, uh, off-grid type power. Uh, that It reduces this, the amount of surge current that it takes to get that motor started running. Uh, Cubby says, 14-hour day, 11 hours driving, 30-minute break after 8 hours driving, 10-hour sleeper berth. Okay, gotcha. So you have to have a 30-minute break after 8 hours of driving. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lola. No, not a genius, just well-read. Uh, Linda Kempler says she thinks it's 5,000 BTUs. Yeah. Um, uh I'll, I'll look it up offline uh, and we'll throw the numbers out next week on that. But the the thing of it is, is that starting it is going to be the trick. Um, you know, because you're starting a compressor, which is an electric motor, which is going to have a pretty good inrush current, pretty amount of, large amount of surge current that's going to be required to get that motor started. And it might trip off your generator but 2500 2000 2500 you might be right on the edge here's what i would do i would try it before i wanted to depend on it to keep me cool if i was out camping so i would try it in the driveway linda um, i would just go out set it up plug it in in the driveway or you know put it in your garage well put the generator outside so you don't asphyxiate yourself please but i would try it and see if it works you know i mean you're not going to hurt anything uh, for sure. Thanks, Tim. We'll see you next week. Take care. Tim's grandson just popped in, so he's going to take off. Uh, Camp Lure One asks, she was thinking about getting a diesel heater rather than uh, using the propane in my RV. What do I think? Um... I think your propane's you're going to be better off with your propane. And the reason I say that is 
the diesel means you're going to have to pack around another fuel. You're going to have to have a fuel can. Um, diesel has an odor to it. Now, those diesel heaters are pretty good, but everyone I've ever been around has just a little teeny odor to it. At least, it's like anything, you're going to get used to it. Uh, I would just stick with my propane. I think it is just so much easier. That way you're not packing around another piece of equipment. It's not. A, it's another piece of equipment that's not going to break, leave you shorthanded. Uh, you would have to carry extra fuel. Uh, you know, uh, you know, you're going to have to carry a five-gallon can of diesel, something like that. Not a great, not a great, yeah. <laughs> anyway, to me, it's a big hassle when you've already got a perfectly good propane heater, assuming it's good and it works. Sounds like Gray Graybird uh, knows a little bit of something about driving. Uh, he says all of that time bumping the dock, lumping is logged as sleeper time, right? <laughs> okay, Linda. Uh, Groovejet, humble. Thank you. Tom Downey, and they stink. I agree. Uh, you know, uh, diesel heaters, I think, you know, um, yeah, diesel smells. You know, the fuel smells. Um, that was probably my only complaint about having a diesel rig was, you know, I always had a pair of gloves uh, when I was fueling. I always had a pair of uh, rubber gloves, not not like surgical rubber gloves, like a real fuel gloves to keep the smell off my hands. Sam Allen, oh, he says, nice. He's a senior systems engineer, engineer supporting 18 school districts and 20 city-county governments. Holy snapping arsels Martha uh, pretty rural so mostly small sites but no lack of work to keep us busy yeah it sounds like it Sam yeah right on glad to have you on board I know exactly what you're doing hey well and there you go gray 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 bird he has a diesel heater and he likes his um, so you know but I think it's whatever you want to get accustomed to. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, they, they work good. I'm not going to knock a diesel heater. I've seriously considered one for uh, the, my truck camper, Bubbles. <laughs> where's Lola tonight? Or not Lola, where's Two Feathers? She's been teasing me about wanting to call it Bubbles. My truck camper. I, I consider doing it. And I would have done it if my furnace overall hadn't turned out so good. Huh, okay, well, that's strange. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Uh, Camp Gora once, she says, I know when I turned on the heater on my rig, it didn't stink, but the little buddy makes me nauseous. That might be, well, I don't know. You know, I have, I have real concerns about burning any heater like that, even though the little buddies have the ceramic elements and all that stuff, they're still going to be putting off carbon monoxide. They have to. It's a combustive process. When you burn stuff, when you burn propane, gasoline, diesel, I don't care what it is, you get carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is poisonous and can kill you. And by the way, Linda, do you have a carbon monoxide monitor in your rig? If you don't, go get one. Because that could be carbon monoxide that's causing you to be nauseous. That's one of the symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning. Now, I'm not saying this to worry you, but for $12, you can go to Home Depot and pick up an inexpensive uh, carbon monoxide sensor. And I would put one in there. Um, but yeah, um, you know, the diesel heaters are exhausted outside, so the exhaust has to be to the exterior of the rig. Uh, propane heaters, uh, like the little buddies and stuff like that, don't exhaust to the outside. Uh, propane heaters that are integrated exhaust do exhaust to the outside. Uh, so I don't care. Like I say, you know, you're going to get a little bit of carbon monoxide, uh, and I would be for checking that. Oh, yeah, of course, uh, I have, uh, sorry, uh, 
Sam Allen and I are having a side conversation here about uh, we're geeking out about IT and stuff. Uh, yeah, um, I have some really good friends that are teachers here in uh, eastern Idaho. And they use the Google apps and the education stuff and the Microsoft and all that. She says, okay, Lynn, uh, <laughs> Greg Graybird says, the diesel camper, the diesel in the camper smells no worse than my socks after three days of camping. Okay. Uh, at 8,400 feet, the propane Atwood would not start a run. We needed the diesel heater for warmth. Yeah, that, that can be an issue. Uh, Linda doesn't spend a lot of time at altitude like that, but um, that can be an issue. I know that uh, my water heater at 6,200 feet would have a hard time bringing 40-degree water up to 100 degrees or 105, which is normally where I run my tankless in my RV. Uh, at that altitude, it would start to struggle. I never really ever noticed my furnace. But yeah, there's a way to get around that. You have to uh, change the orifice uh, on the furnace itself to get it to burn because you have too much gas. The air is so thin. Notice I didn't say it lacked oxygen. I just said the air was thin. Uh, there's too much gas for the combustion to take place. Uh, <laughs> uh, Cubby asks, anybody use forklift LP tanks for motorhome? No. Uh, the reason is is that uh, LP forklift LP tanks are designed to deliver liquid LP, and they're also designed to work laying on their side. And in a pro in a motorhome or any other vehicle, you need to use gaseous. So you have to have gaseous LP, and there are differences in the stem the stem that goes into the tank. So you you cannot, I don't believe you can use motor vehicle propane tanks in an RV. Now, I may be wrong, but I don't think you can use those. John Besmick says, Camp Gold 1 isn't that little buddy heater propane and it's ventless, they put off fumes. They can make you sick. I, I, I have watched videos on this, and I've seen people, but I've never seen anybody that I thought was an expert do a video on one or actually show me carbon monoxide measurements inside of an enclosed space with a little buddy heater running. So I would be damn sure to have good ventilation if I was running one of those. Uh, you know, um, or even a kerosene heater, room heater, something like that. They put off carbon monoxide. They have to. There is no physical way around that. There you go. Yeah, Sam Allen uh, points over to the RV geeks. They're top quality, good guys. They've got a Dutch. Uh, they have a Mountaineer as well. Um, and Newmar. And yeah, they, they make great videos. Um, so, and, and he says they've got a good one on uh, the uh, indoor safe propane heater. You know, they say they're indoor safe, but if you actually read the instructions, they say you need to ventilate the room every once in a while. Uh, because, again, carbon monoxide has to be produced anytime you combust a fuel. And I don't care if it's ceramic or magic, you're going to get carbon monoxide, and that's poisonous. I forgot to do a commercial tonight. If you haven't given me that thumbs up, please do so. Appreciate that. You can support the channel by visiting my Amazon store. There's a link in the description below. You pay the same price. I get a little teeny commission. And everybody, every little bit helps. By the way, as, a, as an aside, I was working on my taxes today. And the first year since 2016, when I started on YouTube, I made a profit. $73 for a whole year's work after I paid for all the software, all the software licensing, connectivity, all of that stuff. I made $73 this year. Hey, what can I say? 
Uh, okay. Okay, so Ben Demby says he had air conditioner. I heard if you put a 1.5 second uh, delay relay on the inside blower fan, you could do reduce the insert current uh, when your air conditioner starts. What do you think? Absolutely, that would work, and that's that's the old way to do it. Before they came up with these soft start kits, and all the soft start kits are just another set of capacitors, and so they just store up a little bit more energy, which helps gets the air conditioning or whatever it is started. Uh, and running but that would work and the reason that works is because that way you don't have the compressor and the fan starting at the same time both electric motors both with surge current and when they both start at the same time they surge at the same time which really increases the amount of surge current okay the amount of extra current it takes to get those two motors started and spinning and so that definitely works. That's the way that we used to do it in the old days. Called the Time Delay Relay, TDR. And you can get a decent one for about 13 bucks. But the soft start kits aren't that expensive. Um, was it Morton's on the move? No, it was uh, No Ordinary... No, it wasn't them. Uh... I'll think of it before I get signed off, which we're going to do here shortly. Um, did a really good video on installing soft starts. Uh, Fate Unbound. Fate Unbound. You can search for them on YouTube. Uh, this video is a couple years old, but if you go over to their channel and look for uh, soft start air conditioners, uh, you're going to find his video, and he did a really good job of explaining what they do and showing you how the, he explained in, ex installed them on his um, uh, on his RV. Uh, I only set up to run my ACs one time off my lithium battery pack just to show I could do it. Um, it we've had this discussion before, and it may be one that comes up here in the next couple of weeks. It's just not practical to try to run an AC off of your lithium batteries. You're just not going to get any life out of it. It's going to be dead in two hours. Thank you, Aaron, for the reminder. Uh, let's see here. I want to catch up. Oh, I do... Got battery on the board and bought another carbon monoxide monitor too. Good. Uh, okay, so Aaron, yeah, the LP tank fittings are completely different. Good. Yeah, they have to be. I mean, because, like I say, one is for liquid and one's for gas. <laughs> Greg Graybird Greg agrees with me. Unvented interior heaters. No way. I'd bet my life. Uh, Bob Wells, yeah, it's true. I mean, you know, uh, carbon monoxide will kill you. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Greg Graybird reminds us that besides producing carbon monoxide, CO, it burns the oxygen in the room. Two ways to die. Uh, okay, so uh, Tom Downey comments, a lot of pilots have been killed with old aircraft heaters. Now we have a regulation that the heater must be pressure checked. No, Linda, if you use your onboard heater, in other words, the built-in propane furnace that came with your RV, you don't happen to open a window. It's vented outside already. So all of the combustion gases go to the outside. Oh, so as Greg Graybird says, his old Nav Navion had a, a gasoline heater, and it could have leaked CO into the cockpit, yeah. Good night, Groove Jet. Good night, Groove Jet. Thank you so much. Uh, Camp Glare 1, pressure checked. I'm not following you. Did I say something about pressure checked? It is getting late. You're welcome. All right. So, 
I'll just uh, go with last uh, moment questions. Good night, John. Thank you so much. I enjoy having you as a viewer and a friend of mine. Appreciate that. Tom says, okay, yeah, gotcha. Oh, I get it. Pressure checked. Uh, what he's saying is, is that the furnace has to be checked for air pressure, low air pressure, I think. Keep in mind that uh, you know it's the same uh, concept of going up in altitude if you're in your camper. Good night, Cubby. Sleep tight. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, uh, yeah. He, what he's saying, I think, what he means is that that the the furnaces now have to, or the heaters now have to have uh, a pressure check. In other words, uh, because they work across such a large out range of altitudes. And you remember how uh, Gray Graybird says um, that his heater, his uh, Atwood, wouldn't start at 8,400 feet. Um, uh, it's because the atmosphere is thinner, and people like to say there's less oxygen available. There's not. There's just less air available, and so uh, there's too much gas. It's it's kind of complicated. Uh, maybe a little more than I want to get to this late in the, in the chat, uh, but. Um, yeah, they pressure check it so that it has to work across a different all ranges of pressures. Yep, pressure check the heater, combustion chamber for leaks, cracks to detect CO leaks. Yep. Oh, am I going to be doing any traveling? Yes. Um... I think I'll be in, uh, I might, here's what would be really optimal if I can make this work. I'd like to be in Northern California around the 10th of June um, for a sort of music festival kind of thing. Um, and then in July, third weekend in July approximately, I, will, I would planning on being in Denver. In between there, I will be uh, out at some of my favorite places around Idaho. Uh, I'll be over at City of Rocks, uh, up at Birch Creek. I'll be over in uh, the Teton Valley uh, near Driggs. Uh, be doing some camping over there. Um, I'll probably be up in the Island Park area. Uh, probably around the 4th of July. Uh, that's usually about the time I like to be up there, get out of here and beat the heat. Um, and then uh, probably, well, I don't know. Uh, that's as far out as I kind of have thought. Um, I don't have plans to be in Arizona anytime soon. Uh, per potentially... Uh, a year from now, uh, there's a good chance I'll probably be in Arizona, maybe from the middle of January through the end of February. Um, if everything kind of stays where it is, you know how fluid things can be. Uh, right now, things are pretty stable in my life. So, uh, anyway, that's kind of what I can tell you. Uh, you know, and those are approximate. I probably won't make it to a mana. No, uh, that's a long run for me. From here to a mana is got to be sixteen hundred miles. Uh, so I don't know if I'll make it to a mana. Now that could change. I might end up going and seeing my dad, right? And if I do, I will take the truck camper and make a two-week trip out of it, kind of thing. I'll go spend a week there and then spend a week, you know. Maybe a three week, a week getting there and a week getting home and a week there. Uh, but that would be maybe, yeah, you know, that's much closer to a mana. That's like 600, 500 miles from a mana. So that makes it a little bit more practical to run up. All right. So a reminder go over out and uh, check out Gray, Gray Bird's channel. Um, he just uh, put up a, his first video, and it was pretty interesting, so I invite you to go out there. 
of course, uh, go over and uh, if you're not a member of uh, and subscriber for of Aaron's channel, do so. And remember, he's going to have a live stream Saturday night, 7 p.m. I'll try to be there. Um, I don't think I have anything going this Saturday, so fingers crossed. Um, okay, Lola, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, it's great. Uh, so nice to have you here, Lola. Thank you, Aaron. Diesel at the pumps is four twenty-five. Uh, yeah, here it's three seventy-nine. You can find it for as low as three sixty-five uh, for diesel here. Yeah, and there's a link to Aaron's channel. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Sure was fun being with you tonight, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Don't forget, if you want to submit a question in advance, feel free to do so. trbolin at gmail.com. Thanks. We'll see you next week. Peace. Good night.